That's what we come back today and I want to talk a little bit more about the problem, how they responded to the problem, how we can respond to problems or needs or lacks in the church, and then how we, what does the Bible say about how we serve in the church? The Bible has a lot to say. Uh, if you are a Christian this morning, this message is for you because the Bible says very, very clearly in more than one place that if you're a Christian, you have been given that means you're not waiting to receive. You have been given already, even if you're not yet aware of it. You've been, you've been given a gift from God for the church. And so if we're not using that gift, that means the church, let me be more specific, that means Lighthouse is missing something. Lighthouse is weaker in an area than it should be because the gift that a person has been given, they're not using it. And God gives gifts to the church through people. So we're going to talk about that this morning. Very often, gifts come to light. Gifts are discovered when there is a problem in the church or when there is a shortcoming. Something's not working right. Something isn't going well in the church. And the problem highlight that it highlights a need in the church and then people step forward to meet that need or to make changes and begin to use gifts they've been given and actually Acts chapter 6 tells us about that and so rather than immediately going on to Acts chapter 7 which is the longest sermon in the New Testament it's Stephen who was one of the chosen men one of the chosen seven and it and chapter 7 that it ends with the martyrdom the first martyr of the Christian church we're going to get into that next time I, as I've prayed about it, I feel that this is where we need to spend a little more time. And I think it's a particularly appropriate for Lighthouse as we come to this. So we come chosen to serve and then choosing to serve. As I was preparing, as I was preparing the message, I, I, I'd first, the Lord often sort of gives me through the, as I pray about how to frame it or to title it, he often gives me a direction with the, with the title. But as I was preparing and praying and making notes, I, I, I was not, I wasn't comfortable. I wasn't happy with chosen to serve. I thought, Lord, that's not, that's not fully it. That's not, and as I, be, as I continued to prepare yesterday, um, the Holy Spirit showed me more about we are chosen to serve as they were chosen to serve, but then we also choose to serve. So we can be chosen by others. We can be chosen by leadership in the church. God certainly chooses us to serve because he gives each one of us gifts. But on our part, there's also a choosing as well. And Acts chapter 6 uh, and other passages talk about, uh, talk about this. So this is where we're going to look today. If this is an area that you'd like to know more about, I can give you four chapters very easily that you can study on your own in an easy way to remember. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you now and then we're going to get into this passage. And there's a pattern here so you can easily remember. I don't even have it on the, on the, uh, on the presentation up here. But think of it in this way. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Huh? Okay, so two chapter 12s. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. Does that make sense? So two chapter 12s, two chapter 4s. And there's, so there's a book and then a 1 Corinthians, another book, and a 1 Peter. So that can help you remember. If you'll look at those four chapters, those four chapters talk about serving and using gifts. So Romans 12, oh, you help me. Romans 12, okay, Ephesians, 1 Peter there you go. You got it. Okay? So you can do some reading and some praying on your own. There are other areas of the New Testament that specifically talk about deacons and overseers. Okay? Um, but we're not going to focus on that so much this morning. We're going to talk more about serving. So we look at this. As we come to this this morning, um, I want to remind you of where we ended, where we, where we finished last time. Uh, as we were leading up to this problem within the church, we remember first that there were problems out, outside the church, right? There was, uh, there was opposition outside the church, but they overcame that opposition and they remained strong. And in fact, they flourished 
in spite of outside opposition. If you will read through the history of the church from the very beginning even up to now, wherever there has been outside opposition, whether from government, usually from government or society in some way, you will see that almost always the church flourishes in times of opposition. The church is purified. The church is made holy. As the church is stripped away of external things they can depend on, instead they lean on God and they receive strength from His Spirit and they're strengthened and they grow and they multiply. That's the pattern of the church. When the church is in the greatest danger is when there are problems within the church when there are when there's opposition where that when there are attacks that arise or problems that arise that aren't dealt with in the right way within the church that's when the greatest damage is done to the church of God Acts chapters if it's not handled in the right way and Acts chapter 6 gives us a great pattern for this and so as we come this morning um, we come to this Acts chapter 6 the crisis in Acts chapter 6 it's more than it's not external it's internal and there is a problem in the church and the problem comes to light through um, through murmuring or complaining depending on what your Bible translation says so we look at the next one uh, slide chapter 2 it tells us about it in Acts 6 1 that the believers were rapidly multiplying it's a growing pain we talked about this last time right so there's a growing pain and the growing pain one group says hey our widows are being overlooked and we've talked about this before so I don't want to go into all of that and then we look at the next click what we see here are the two groups the two main groups where the where the friction point is do you know brothers and sisters wherever there are where we are different in church where we are different just look around there are external and internal differences but where we are different in church whether it is through our, our socioeconomic status or our ethnic or cultural uh, differences those points of differences it's a little bit like the fault lines of a, a, a between two parts of the earth where they rub it can cause an earthquake and usually where the differences are that is where will that's where the problems will come almost always almost always and that's where we need the oil of the Holy Spirit we really need the oil of the Holy Spirit and so this is what we see this is where the this is where the difference lies and we see the differences between them uh, some of us would say but 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 they're all Jews in the same way that some of us would say but we're all Christians there are differences there are differences and they happen within the church and so we see the, quite a lot of differences between these two groups. It comes to light through murmuring or complaining. And I want to talk just very briefly about, about murmuring uh, or complaining within the church. Please, this morning, don't think, well, you're talking about me. You're pointing fingers at me. I promise you I am not. This was on the, this was, this was the next point already um, that was, that was, in, in, in the preaching and the teaching that I have on Acts chapter 6 and this is for all of us this morning um, may I say something to you as a church leader and Pastor Renee would tell you the same thing when there are problems in the church and I just want to speak very openly and very frankly with you this morning when when you're a church leader whether you're a pastor or whether you're a leader of a small group or you're on the board or you are part of a, a group and there's leadership within the group when problems arise, when murmuring, when complaining arises, or when things come, our, come to our attention, it's, it's not always easy to know what to do and when to do it. Did you know that? You would think it would be very clear. Well, just do it this way. It's not always clear. There are some things that kind of come up or bubble up, and it's absolutely right that you ignore it. It's a little bit like you ignore it, it will go away. If you give it too much attention, brrr, it comes up. It really is. There are other things that you just wait for a while. There are other things that you deal with and you deal with immediately. And it really takes the wisdom of the Lord to know when and how and what. That's why the Bible has so much to say for those who are 
overseers or pastors or elders and those who are deacons in lighthouse it would be the board it would be the board that's why the Bible says so much about you've got to be full of the Holy Spirit and you've got to be full of wisdom which comes from God because it when things like this when problems arise when criticisms arise if we don't handle it in the right way we can cause a lot of problems we can great harm can come to the church and brothers and sisters if there's any place the enemy wants to win a victory. It's in God's church. It really is. If there's any place, and if there's any place we want him defeated, it's in God's church. It's in God's church. And so, as we, what should we do when this comes up? Because it's in, in Acts chapter 6. It says that they murmured or that they complained. And so you see, I've, I've put these, uh, <laughs> I have all these up here to give us a graphic, <laughs> to give us a graphic of this. How do, how do we handle it? Um, do we just say, no, 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 I'll never say anything, I just keep quiet, and inside it's building up, and we're thinking, ah, like that, should we never, never say anything? I don't think that's what the Bible says. And I think all of us, if we're honest, we would say we have, we have at times, or, all of, or we've come out of church, and we've been dissatisfied with something, right? There's something we haven't liked as much. Something has rubbed us the wrong way. There's something that hasn't been pleasing to us. And sometimes it's a one-time thing, and sometimes it's something that grows. So how do we know when to do something? How do we know when to say something? How do we know when we perhaps are involved and we've stepped over the line in some way? May I give you just a few guidelines and then you bring it to the Lord? What I would say is this. I would say if in the area of critiquing or murmuring, if it is something that becomes a fairly common topic of conversation in the group that you are part of, if it's a fairly common topic, then probably you've stepped over the line. Or I should say we've stepped over the line, okay? If it becomes, if it becomes a pretty common topic and something isn't done about it, um, then we've probably stepped over the line. That's, that's one thing I would say. The second thing I would say is this, and by the way, this, this, is, this is for pastors and leaders as well. If we talk about a problem more than we pray about a problem, then we also probably have stepped over a line that we shouldn't have stepped over as Christians in the church of God. Does that make sense? So if it's become a frequent topic of conversation and we haven't done something about it, but it's just then I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know any other way to say it beyond you know what I mean, you know what I mean, then we've probably stepped over a line that we shouldn't have. If we're talking about it more than we're praying about it, we've probably stepped over the line. I, 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 that's really simple, but that's what I think. Now, before some of you say, hmm, she's pointing a finger at me this morning, I promise you, I'm not. I promise you, I'm not. Um, so we look at this, and I want to, but I, I do want to say one other thing. How do we, and, and I can look at myself as well. How do we, if we, so that's, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a self-examination. How about if we are part of a group where we feel this might be going on? I challenge you, if you're part of a group where this is going on, I challenge you to be brave in the Lord and to be strong in the Lord and to protect the family of God. It is far easier in a group where this type of thing is going on to be silent or to just kind of like, ha, 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 yeah, and it comes up again and again, rather than to stand up and say something to a friend. Because usually, when we get into this area, we talk about it in groups with friends, right? We talk about it in groups that we're close with. And so I urge you and I encourage you, when there is a murmur or a complaining, and by the way, Acts chapter 6 is going to show us that there was a problem and it had to be dealt with and it came to light in the complaint. So it's not always, it's not, oh, that's sin, you shouldn't say anything, you shouldn't do anything. No, Acts 6 sh shows us a different pattern. But what I would say is this, love your brother, love your sister, and love the church by talking with them, by saying, by either changing the subject 
or by saying, let's, let's move in a different direction, or by encouraging them. It seems like this is an issue. Why not talk with the pastor? Why not go to them? Why not, let's, why don't we, why don't we do something about it? Why don't we deal with it? Acts chapter 6 shows us this. It shows us this. And I will tell you this area, it's sensitive, it's difficult, because we're with friends when these things come up. But I encourage you, love the church of God and love your brother and sister, because complaints and murmuring left undealt with, left left alone, left when they're not dealt with, when they continue, they poison and they embitter and they harden our brothers and our sisters and they will grow. They will grow and they will begin to poison others as well. I urge you, we, we don't want to let the devil win in this area. We want God to win, right? Amen. Amen. We want God to win. And so, and so, as we look again at Acts chapter 6, what happens? First of all, as we look at that, I want to encourage you, when problems come, problems are usually opportunities as well. They really are. Problems are opportunities in three ways, probably more, but three ways. And let me let you, as, you, as we look at it, because I don't know about you, my human response, when there's a problem, it's, oh no! I thought we were having a good time. I thought everything was going okay. Let's just, let's just sail smoothly for a while. But I believe, because problems always come, that because God is with us, there are opportunities in those problems. And here are three opportunities. The first one is an opportunity to examine. First of all, instead of looking outward, oh, they, they did this, and they whatever, and this, first, examine your own heart. We examine our own heart, we examine our own attitudes, we examine how we're looking at something that we think is wrong, and then beyond that, examine, okay, Lord, is there something different that should be done? That's something that pastors need to do and should be doing as well. This one is pretty hard, because I don't know about you, but for me as a human being, last time I checked, when a problem comes up, especially if it's directed at me, my first impulse is to get defensive. It really is. And my first impulse when something comes at me is to immediately point back as well. So it really takes the help of God to see, okay, Lord, there's an opportunity in here. So first thing, here's an opportunity to examine. Second one, there's an opportunity to exercise our faith. Now this may not sound very inspired to you, but this is from the Lord, I believe, this morning. And, we, and there's an opportunity to exercise your faith. God, here's the way things are going now. Lord, I trust you, I'm going to have faith that you can do something different, that you will do something different, that I can do something differently than the way I'm doing it now. And there's an opportunity there. When things are sailing smoothly, we will seldom make changes, right? When things are sailing smoothly, we will seldom observe too closely. It's great. Everything's going all right. It's when the waves get choppy that we have to look at it. But God is there in the waves, and God is there in the storm, and God is here in the middle of his church. Amen? Amen. Amen. And in relationships, too. God's in the middle of relationships. And third, there's an opportunity to express our love. What? That doesn't sound like it has anything to do. Let me give you two scriptures that will, that will show us that when problems come, there's an opportunity to express our love. Okay? And let's look at the next one. Keep that in mind. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 2, 3, and 4. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. To me, in verse 4, there's such a key to settling problems and to handling disagreements. I really, really mean that. When I'm in a, a disagreement with someone, and probably, and, and for you as well, when, there's, when it's like this between us, our human nature, our human nature is to look only at our side. I'm right. I'm right, I'm right, they're wrong. I've done right, they've done wrong. But there's an opportunity there because the Holy Spirit lives in us to help us change the way we look and to say, okay, it's not just I'm right and they're wrong. How can I show love 
in this situation where there's a disagreement, where there's another side, and there's an opportunity to express love by looking not just at what I want, not just how I think it should be done, not just how I want it done my way and what's comfortable for me, but by looking at my brother, by looking at my sister, and understanding maybe there's another way. Maybe it doesn't have to be the way exactly that I want it. There can be another way. And in that, there's the opportunity for an expression of love. One more verse, Romans 12, 10 and 11. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. And here again is this beautiful picture about honoring somebody above myself. And when I can do that, when I can do that, I can't do it in myself. Oh, you know what? Holy Spirit really has to help me. Because without the Holy Spirit, you and I will always pull for what we want. Always, always. The Holy Spirit helps us to lower those walls and to consider one, another's, one another. Because the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6 put this into practice and they did the right thing, the devil lost and God won. Amen? Amen. And that's what we want. That's what they wanted then. That's what we want too. We want that as well when we come to situations. Seven men are chosen. They're chosen to oversee this. I want you to keep in mind that the leadership is being, it doesn't say it directly, but the leadership is being criticized. In fact, Peter's being criticized. You know, that guy that I like so much. Peter, because Peter really was, he was the de facto leader of the group. But for sure, the leadership is being criticized because the apostles were the ones that were doing this. They were the ones that were overseeing, they had to. They were overseeing the food program because later on when they make a change, the apostles say, we will hand this responsibility over to them. That means it had been their responsibility and then they pass it on. So there is strongly an implied criticism of the leadership. Okay, I mean, I think that I don't think there's any way around that. But they all did the right thing because it couldn't just be the leadership that did the right thing. Others had to do the right thing as well. And for it to work out according to God's plan, all sides have to do the right thing. Let's look at who did the right thing. Okay, the first group that did the right thing, those that had been wronged, those that whose feelings were hurt. Those who said, our widows have been ignored. We're not getting Christian portions like everybody else, if you want to use lighthouse terminology. They did the right thing because instead of continuing to murmur or complain about a situation, they opened it up to the leadership and they said, hey, we feel this is happening. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly that it was. Probably there was some of it going on, none of it on purpose. It was just the church was growing rapidly. But they did the right thing by bringing it into the open and going to the leader leadership rather than allowing it to continue. And sometimes that's what we have to do, brothers and sisters. We must, we must. So they did the right thing. And they trusted, they trusted that the leaders, the apostles, would then do the right thing. Who else did the right thing? The Hebrew-speaking believers, they did the right thing. They were the majority group. They were the group in power, if you will. And they did the right thing by doing what? By expressing love. They humbled themselves, and they let the group that was in the minority take over the running of the food program. And in love, they humbled themselves to their brothers and their sisters. So they did the right thing. Who else did the right thing? The seven chosen men did the right thing as well. This was not a glamorous task, by the way. We would, most people would say these were the first deacons of the church, even though there wasn't an office yet, uh, or board members, if you will, uh, as, uh, is what we would call it in Lighthouse. But it was not glamorous work. You say, ooh, I want to be a board member at Lighthouse. No, you don't. <laughs> not unless God calls you. Not unless God equips you. Because you know what it means, don't you? They were chosen to serve at the tables. That's exactly what the word means, to serve the tables. How many of you in your earlier life, you were a waitress or a waiter in a restaurant. 
Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, I'm raising my hand because in my earlier life, I was a waitress in a Chinese restaurant in Alabama. In Alabama. The Lord knew he was preparing me, <laughs> okay? I was, let me tell you, it's nobody's dream job, is it? Is it? Those of you that did, was it your dream job? You loved it, right? Uh, poor tips, bad service, terrible mess all over the table, all sorts of things like that. It's nobody's dream job. But brothers and sisters, these seven men that's what they were called to do. The word to serve, it means to wait on tables. So it has to do with really practical, practical work. Very, very practical work. It's nobody's dream job. But you know what? As far as we can tell, they did it right. Because this problem, this complaint never bubbles up again in the church. So they did the right thing as well. They took on the responsibility, an unglamorous, demanding task and as far as we know they did it well they did it well who else did the right thing the leaders the apostles did the right thing as well they responded to the complaint they refused to get distracted because you know what when there are problems and things that come up Pastor Renee would tell you the same thing. It's very easy to get distracted. We've got to handle this. We've got to handle that. And then we get away from the main work that the Lord has called us to do, which is prayer and the ministry of the Word. That has to be that. And so the apostles did the right thing as well. And one of the things I appreciate here, the apostles, and it's a lesson for me as well, um, the apostles didn't get defensive and say, well, yeah, but you know, those, those Greek-speaking widows, they're just greedy. They don't, you know, they're, they're whatever. Rather than being defensive, they acknowledge there's a problem and they deal with it immediately. So the apostles, the leadership did the right thing as well. And when everyone does the right thing, God, when everyone does the right thing in God's church, God can work, listen, God can work out any problem. He can. Any problem, any difference, any difficulty. God can work it out. And God puts things in the church, in us, to work it out. He really does. He does. And that's what, we're, that's what we look at this morning. And so, because they did this, because all the sides responded in the right way, a situation that could have split the church instead strengthened the church. Acts 6-7. So, God's message continued to spread. Maybe you say, how can you say that? How can that be? Mm, I only have five minutes left. Oh, this is not going to work. We'll do our best, right? Six minutes left. A few more minutes. Okay. Um, so God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. When we respond in the right way, even to problems, God's plan, God's program, God's church flourishes and grows and that's what happened here. Now, very quickly, very quickly, in the few minutes that remain, let's switch gears just a little bit with this as a background and let's look at Lighthouse. How do we serve at Lighthouse? And we're going to be, uh, Michelle, I'm going to be skipping some slides as we look at that. How do we serve? Uh, look at Acts 6, 3 and 4 and there's something here for, for us in Acts 6, 3 and 4. They were, they were told, choose people who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. So when we serve in the church with the gifts that God has given us, with the gifts God has given us, we need to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. May I say to you, though we all need this in serving, I believe the greater the responsibility, the more this is needed. The more this is needed. The greater the area of influence in the church, the more this is needed. I also believe the more you serve in relation to people in the church, the more you need this as well. We, we always need it, but how much more when we're working with people a lot? Because you know what? People aren't always easy. People aren't always friendly. In God's church, yep, God's church. People have had a hard time when they come to church on Sunday. Maybe they didn't get enough sleep. Maybe they've had bad news. Maybe they haven't had a lot of time with the Lord and they come in kind of prickly and kind of whatever. And you're, have, and, and you're serving the Lord and you've got to deal with them. It takes the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives to control us, to control us. So you're serving, it takes the Holy Spirit controlling you 
so that when you get bumped in service, what comes out is gentleness. What comes out is kindness. What comes out is grace instead of something hard, instead of something sharp. And we need wisdom, too, that comes from God so that we know what to say, so that we know how to say it, so that we know what to do as we serve, as we serve. We've got to have that. May I tell you why else we need the fullness of the Spirit and the control? By fullness of the Spirit, I think that implies in this area a strongly the control of the Spirit, the control of the Spirit in our lives. And I just want to say this very openly and very frankly to each one of you here this morning because we're talking about service. If you are going to step out in faith to use the gift that God has given you to build up the church, which is what we're called to do, you are going to be criticized. You are. You are. It's going to happen. There will be nobody who steps out in service who will not receive some sort of negative feedback or some sort of, or, 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 or some sort of criticism. It happens. It happens to everybody. It happens to pastors. In the, in the first service, I gave some examples for pastors, and I'm sure Pastor Renee could give you some. Honestly, the nicest criticism we would ever receive is that somebody falls asleep while we're preaching. That's the nicest. That's the nicest. We, we have plenty of other things, and, and, and I'll be honest, I don't like that. Do you like that, Pastor Renee? I don't like it either. But I can promise you, there are far worse things that come our way people rolling their eyes, people coming forward at the end to give us a critique of the message, and that's the only thing they ever say or whatever. These, well, you say, well, Pastor Jennifer, go talk to them. No way. I'm not going to go to them and say, hey, you blah, 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 blah. I want the Holy Spirit to control me in that area. Criticism and negative feedback will be part, it will be part of serving the Lord. And if that is hard for you, and if you say, no, don't, I don't want to hear it, then, then, be, then be careful about serving. Be careful about serving um, because it's going to happen. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit and we need His control. And we need His, we need His, um, we need His control. Just put it very, very simply. That's, that's the easiest way. Um, that's the easiest way to put it. Look at a few other things as well. And, we're, and we'll take just a two or three minutes, uh, maybe about three minutes more. Look at the next passage. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter 5, 2. And this is something specifically for pastors, but there's something there for all of us as well. Be shepherds under your care, serving as overseers. Here's this word again, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you're willing as God wants you to be. And so I do this, I serve and you serve, not because I have to, not because the pastors have said, would you do this? But what I have to do is get my motivation right. Got to get my motivation right. Why? Because God wants me to. God's put a gift in me and he wants me to use it. And so I serve with willingness. I serve with willingness. So first of all, I serve with the fullness of the Holy Spirit and with wisdom. Secondly, I serve with willingness, not a grudging, I have to, or whatever. Oh, listen, if you are serving with a grudging spirit, there is no joy in that, is there? There's no joy. It robs you of any joy of service. It robs you of any fulfillment of doing what God has called you to do. And God says, I want you to serve with willingness because I want you to. And do you know what God says? We won't look at the scripture now, but God says, and I, I'm using, I'm changing the, the pronouns just a little bit. And God says, I will reward you. I will reward you. And one day I will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. So there's the motivation. If our motivation is for the praise of men, if our motivation is for honor because I have the title, if our motivation is because I want people to say, thanks, you did a great job, I will be disappointed in service. I will be. I will be. We'll be disappointed. And so we serve with willingness. And finally, in 1 Peter 4, Peter says, Eat as each has received a gift. What? Uh, uh, uh. Got it? As each has received a gift. Are you a Christian this morning? Yes. You have received a gift. At least one. At least one. You say, ooh, I've received a gift. <laughs> Go back and read Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4. The gift ain't for you, <laughs> to use bad English. The gift is for the church.
The gift is for the church. It's to build them up. Now you will be, as you step out in faith, you say, but I'm scared. Let me just pause right there. Some of you are going to say, but pastor, but pastors, there are people in the church who do this better than I do. Guess what? There are, the, there are people in the church that do things better than I do as well. So what do you do? You step out in faith and you begin to use the gift that God has given you. And as you use it in faith, in humility, God will grow the gift. You will grow in skill in that gift. You will grow in confidence in that gift. It's very, very simple. You will. But you've got to step out at some point. And there will be that point in your life where you say, ha. Ah, to step out. It's not a comparison with other people. You have to start somewhere. If you don't take a step, you'll never start. You'll never, you'll never get further down the road. You'll never grow in that gift. You've got to. You've got to. And you're responding to the Lord. Okay? And so we close with this. We've received a gift. Use it to serve one another. It doesn't build me up. I do it to serve you. There's that common, there's that lowly word again. The, the, the simplest and mo most necessary and most mundane thing I can do that has to be done every day, serve food, clear the table, wash the dishes. That's to use that language, to serve, okay? That's what it means, but it has to be done. And I serve you by doing that, and you serve me by doing that. How do we do it? Okay, the final three things, here we go. Serve as good stewards. What does that mean? That means it's not my gift. It means it's God's. It's God's, right? And I have to be a good steward. I have to do, I have to do properly with it. I have to do it well. I have to use that gift to bless others, not <coughs> hit people over the head. Because sometimes we hit people over the head with our gifts, right? Oh, you don't do that. Just I do that. <laughs> We're good stewards. That means I handle it carefully. Lord, I answer to you. So we serve as good stewards. Secondly, we serve faithfully. That means, Lord, I do it in the right way. That means, Lord, you can count on me. Now, I, I'm making a practical application. There's much more in that. But to serve faithfully. That means you're doing it. You can be counted on. You're going to use the gift that God has given you. It's not, well, if it suits me, well, if it doesn't interfere with my free time, well, if you can arrange the service, I'm sorry, I know I'm stepping on some toes now, but here we go. Well, if you can arrange it so that it doesn't put me out in any way, then I'll serve. Brothers and sisters, it can't be how we serve in the, in the, in the body of Christ. We serve faithfully, and it's just okay. And in service, there will be sacrifice that we will. It'll put us out. It'll make us tired. It won't be convenient. We'll have to give up some free time. We'll get criticized, but I'm going to serve faithfully anyhow. I'm going to serve faithfully. And finally, I serve with God's strength. That's what it says. If anyone serves, there it is again, he should do it with the strength God provides. Why do we have to have God's strength to serve? Why? Because serving's not always easy, brothers and sisters. You're not always going to get thanks for it. You're going to get tired. And you're going to have to have God's strength. Because you know what? God's strength never gives out. God's strength never gives up. God's strength never wavers. And sometimes we can start in God's strength and end up in our own. But we can do it with joy, with God's strength. That's how we serve really, really simply. Is there more than that? There's a lot more than that. But that's just a simple, that's what the Lord has put on my heart. We serve with the fullness of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We serve faithfully. We serve with God's strength. We serve in all of these ways as good stewards. All of these things we serve. And then the church of God is built up. And then the problems are met and dealt with. And then the weak areas of Lighthouse are made strong. And then the needs of Lighthouse are met because God has put gifts in you for your church and for His church. Amen? Amen. Lord, we thank you that you've given each one of us at least one gift 
Father, I pray that we would be faithful stewards. We would be good stewards. We would do it in your strength. Lord, that when um, ingratitude or, or criticism comes our way, Lord, help us just to keep our eyes on you. Lord, when problems come up, Father, give us humility to, to handle them and wisdom to know how to do it. And Lord, give us hearts that say, I'm going to love my brother or my sister in the midst of this problem. Lord, I want to do it right. God, I want you to win, and I want the devil to lose. And I want your church to be built up in each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.